All right, so this little video is about mapping reductions. A mapping reduction is a relationship between two sets of things. So you mapping reduce one set to another set. Uh, mapping reductions are used to show that something is undecidable. So once you know that a language or a set is undecidable, you can use a mapping reduction from it to another language to show that the other language or set is undecidable. But first, let's just go through the definition of a mapping reduction. So, mapping reduction is something that happens between two sets, and this little notation here means that A is mapping reducible to B. So, it's a less than or equal to sign with a little M underneath it. Um, it's less than or equal to in the sense that A is less undecidable or equally undecidable as B. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but here's, uh, here's what it means. So, A is mapping reducible to B if there is a um, total computable function, and this is often abbreviated TCF for total computable function. So if there's a TCF from A to B that has a special property such that um, little a is a member of big A if and only if f of little a is a member of B. So the way to think about mapping reductions is that there's a mapping reduction between two sets. If you can build a total computable function that takes you from one set to the other set and if you give it something that's not in the one set then it gives you something that's not in the other set. So it's, uh, it maps you from one set to the other and always preserves membership. Before we get too much farther along, let's just talk about what a total computable function is. A total computable function is a function you can do with a Turing machine. So this guy right here is a function that can be implemented on a Turing machine. Now, we haven't uh, used Turing machines to implement functions yet. This, will, this is a new idea. When we say that a Turing machine implements a function, what we mean is that if you give the Turing machine the input to that function, then the Turing machine halts with the output of that function on its accepting tape. So, for example, if you had a Turing machine that implemented the function plus 1, and you gave it 1024 as input, then it would take that 1024 and write down 1025 and return that as the output. When a Turing machine returns something as output, it just means that it halts in the accepting state with the read-write head to the right of the output. So this particular Turing machine would halt with 1025 on its output and with its head right next to the 1025. I think that's barely off frame, but hopefully you can get it. So, in pictures, if this is the set A, and this is the set B, and A has three things in it, and B has two things in it, it actually doesn't matter how many things A and B have in them. What matters is that if an arrow starts off in A, then it always ends up in B. If the arrow starts off in A, then it has to end up in B. If the arrow starts off in A, then it has to end up in B. Now everything in A can map to the same thing in B. It doesn't matter. It just has to start in A and end in B. Similarly, if an arrow starts off outside of A, then the arrow has to end outside of B. Outside of A, outside of B. And you don't have to cover everything that's outside of B, but you just have to make sure that if the function starts off with an input that's not in A, that it ends up with an output that's not in B. So that's what mapping reduction means. It's a fun relationship between two sets. You have to build a total computable function which has this property. If you give that function something in A, it always gives you back something in B. If you give it something that's not in A, it gives you back something that's not in B. And you might have guessed that because this is the if and only if operator right here. So let's just do a very quick example. 
So here's a set x such that x is an odd number. And I'll just call that odd for odd numbers. That's barely off screen, so let me just move that a little bit. There. Now you've got x a little bit more. Okay. x such that x is an odd number, and even is y such that y is an even number. Okay, so that's even and odd, and so what I'm going to do is define a mapping reduction between even and odd. So I'm going to say that odd mapping reduces to even. So what I have to do is I have to write down a function f, which if I give it an odd number, will give me an even number. If I give it something that's not an odd number, it will give me something that's not an even number. And I have to be able to implement this on a Turing machine. So let's try this f. f of n is equal to n plus 1. So that's my function. Um, I just take whatever number you give me, I add 1, and give you the output. So I've got to say two things. First of all, f is a total computable function. So I hope it's easy to convince you that I can implement this f on a Turing machine, because all it does is it takes its input and it adds 1. So you can do it on a Turing machine. The other thing you have to do is you have to show that it's total. Total just means that it's defined for every input. Any input you give me, I can add one to it, and so it's total. Not a lot to talk about there. The next thing I have to do is I have to say, if you give me an odd number, I'll give you an even number. So, if n is odd, n plus 1 is even. So that's the first half of the last step. If you give me something that's odd, I'm going to add 1 to it, and that's going to give me something that's even. For example, 2, I'm sorry, 3 is odd. 3 plus 1 is 4. 4 is even. It's not a difficult thing to show that every odd number plus 1 is an even number. Similarly, if n is not odd, n plus 1 is not even. Um, so if you give me something like 2, which is not odd, I'll add something to it and get 3, which is not even. So what I've done is I've given you a function, which is a total computable function, which takes odd numbers to even numbers, and non-odd numbers to non-even numbers. That's a very simple example, but hopefully uh, gets you thinking. Okay, that's it.